Well, good morning, everybody. I'm Dr. Casey Bradley, Senior Technical Solutions Manager for Innovations and Applications, SWINE, for DSM Animal Nutrition and Health. Thank you for joining us for today's press conference titled, The Impact of Vitamins on Swine Production. We have an esteemed panel of experts that will be joining us today to cover topics such as reproductive failure, improving lifetime soil productivity, and the effects of inadequate vitamin nutrition and how it plays a role in sows and their offspring. We hope you find your time with us as valuable today. I do want to make one special note that we have reserved the last 20 minutes after all the speakers are done for questions and answers. So if you could kindly reserve those questions until the end, we'll have plenty of time to answer those. And with that, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Ken Stalder, full professor with the Iowa State University. He will be discussing reproductive failure and why it may not be the number one reason why sows are called today. He will discuss lameness and how it re relates to why sows are called from the herd. And he will also be discussing our guilt poster. So, Dr. Stolder. I thank you for the opportunity this morning. Um, going to talk to you just a little bit about uh, feet and leg soundness, how it impacts the breeding herd of commercial uh, swine herds. Uh, many, uh, we know that uh, sows leaving the herd at an increasing rate today. It's not unusual to have 55 to 65 percent replacement rate in uh, many sow herds. And in most cases, that's, in my view, an unacceptable rate. Many of these uh, cullings go back to uh, feet and leg soundness. We know that reproductive failure, though, is the most reported reason that sows leave the breeding herd. But I'd argue that a lot of uh, these reasons uh, that sows leave the herd, the, the producers check what they see last. For example, they fail to breed or they fail to conceive and what have you. But the real reason may have occurred before that. Let me use a uh, simple example. If a sow has poor feet and legs and she doesn't want to stand up and eat and farrowing, she's obviously going to get thin. She gets thin and when she uh, gets weaned, she may not cycle in a timely manner. If she doesn't cycle in a timely manner, she may not cycle at all. If she cycles, she may not uh, conceive, or if she does conceive, uh, she may not uh, hold that litter till she farrows. So you can see where uh, a secondary reason, or the, or maybe you'd call it the, the primary reason, often doesn't get recorded in these record-keeping systems of many of our commercial herds. They don't relate the, the actual causative reason for calling. They actually just check what they see last or what has occurred last. But at any rate, we know that even using that data, feet and leg soundness is the second leading call, cause for sows leaving the breeding herd and for mortality reasons in the breeding herd. And we know that sows don't pay for themselves based on economic work that we've done until they reach the third or fourth parity. Third if you've got a fair to finish operation and the fourth parity if you uh, have a breed to wean operation because in a breed to wean you have to split the profit between the sow herd and those that are finishing. And most of our sows don't stay in the herd that long, or if they do, they just barely pay for themselves, and then they exit the breeding herd. Uh, Joe and I were talking er earlier this morning that many herds average below that third parity. So that tells you that uh, these sows are slowly eating away at the producer's equity in that operation if they don't stay in the herd till at least the third parity. So you can see how feet and legs contribute to this reproductive failure. And so that I believe that feet and leg soundness reasons uh, are for culling are under, underestimated, at, at least in the U.S. Uh, commercial breeding herd, and I think it probably occurs in many other countries as well. That's what's led us to reproduce uh, the third iteration of our feet and leg soundness poster that we have up, up here showing you today. Uh, we've taken the opportunity to reproduce it again, to try to educate producers on what proper feet and leg soundness is, also what proper uh, 
uh, reproductive soundness is. Because we obviously know that if we select a good animal up front, she's more likely to be uh, have good feet and legs throughout uh, her reproductive period. Also, we know that if we don't select for it, sows generally have a more opportunity to become lame, and when they become lame, they're more likely to fail reproductively in some manner. In an Iowa State study that we did uh, almost 10 years ago, we looked at you know, 3,000 sows at, at the packing plant and tried to ascertain why those sows were called. And 85% of those sows had at least one foot lesion. So we know that foot lesions are prevalent in the, her in the sows that leave the breeding herd. Now, whether all of those were lame, you know, we're looking at animals that are on the rail. You can't tell that. But certainly, these foot lesions were really prevalent. So obviously, we're here uh, working with DSM on this project. And you want to understand how uh, nutrition can impact, and specifically, vitamin D can help improve the skeletal strength of sows. And of course, nutrition overall impacts or can impact uh, that skeletal strength, and we've known this for many years. Things like calcium and phosphorus uh, affect bone strength. Well, also vitamin D, and, and uh, Jill will talk to you more about the high D benefits, but vitamin D is very critical in developing good bone structure. Um, also, we think that this will have a great impact on as we develop gilts and have a higher uh, selection rate in gilts because uh, we can get better get, uh, bone and foot and overall structural development in sows as well. So that's what we're trying to do, combine better nutrition, better selection with uh, these tools so that producers get a better gilt into the breeding herd so that that gilt has uh, a better opportunity to last longer or to remain in the breeding herd for a longer period of time with the end goal of her having more pigs per lifetime. And one of the things I'd like the industry to get away from is uh, quit looking at PSY as their uh, you know, goal to look at for sow productivity and start looking at pigs produced per sow lifetime. PSY is pretty nebulous value, and pigs produced per sow lifetime is the one that has real economic value, and that's how these tools and and things like Heidi can help improve that value in commercial breeding herds. So with that, I'll stop and let the next speaker have a, have a chance to visit. Thank you, Dr. Stalder. Next up is Dr. Joseph Hahn, Senior Technical Support Manager for DSN. Dr. Hahn will discuss the novel solutions for improving lifetime sow productivity. He will talk about the new value of the new high D for gilt development and how a water soluble program could bring benefits in an innovative way to address delivery challenges in gilt production or gilt development, war studs, and other production areas. Thank you, Casey. Uh, what I'd like to say today is uh, at DSM, uh, we are one of the largest vitamin manufacturers in the world. Uh, basic and 10 of the 13 uh, major required vitamins. And one of the things we've looked at is just recently in the last uh, year, we've gotten approval in both the U.S. and Canada, so in the North American market, to utilize a new technology. And it's a new vitamin D metabolite uh, called, called uh, high D. But what that actually is, it's our classic vitamin D3 that we would supplement. But it's actually been modified with a simple uh, hydroxyl group or an oxygen and a hydrogen and add on to it to make it a unique molecule. And uh, it's as important because high, uh, vitamin D status is important for building a better base, building a better gilt, bringing her into the herd, giving her the opportunity for more lifetime productivity, as, as Ken mentioned. Um, vitamin D is critical for calcium and phosphorus metabolism, but it's actually got beyond bone implement implications as well. It's important in muscular function, uh, smooth muscle function, it might be involved with reproductive issues, and it's also uh, involved in cellular differentiation, which is actually critical points when developing the fetus uh, 
within the gestation period. So a lot of key things are linked to vitamin, proper vitamin D nutrition. So high D is a unique molecule uh, with the hydroxyl group. Because of the adding this hydroxyl group, it actually becomes a water-soluble vitamin versus a fat-soluble vitamin. This is important because it actually increases and improves the efficiency that the molecule is absorbed across the intestinal tract. So instead of using the fat-soluble route, which is less efficient, it actually directly absorbs across the intestinal mucosa. Uh, additionally, because it's already got the hydroxyl group on it, the liver does not have to transform the vitamin D3 into 25-hydroxy. And, and this 25-hydroxy D3, or our high D product, uh, is the storage form in the body. If a veterinarian wants to assess the vitamin D status of an animal, they're going to measure serum levels of 25-hydroxy. So uh, we can improve the vitamin D status rapidly using our new molecule. Uh, and we feel that's important for structural integrity and, and building a better gilt. And as Ken said, the, the, the structural, building that better gilt really leads into some important economic factors uh, as far as gilt development. Uh, I've been involved with a, as a nutritionist for a, a major production company, and one of the things we noticed is uh, if we don't have uh, enough gilts that qualify for selection, we end up putting substandard gilts in, and they're the animals that actually fall out uh, and, and cause some of the problems. So if we can create a better pool, a better gilt pool, and, and research worldwide with this product has actually shown that we can improve up to 5 to 7% improvement in gilt selection rates uh, with the use of high D. So those improved gilt selection rates actually give uh, the producer the opportunity to put a better gilt into the herd. And if you can also maybe maintain better retention in the herd because of better structural integrity, we can also improve the parity distribution. The older animals are more productive. So a, a parity three, four, or five female actually has a much better reproductive rate uh, than a gilt. And the offspring from those pigs actually perform better in the finisher. So if we can improve the parity distribution within a sow herd, we actually improve overall economics quite a bit. Uh, lastly, I'd like to mention uh, we do have a new version that we're introducing here at, at World Pork this week. We actually have approval for a water-soluble version. So we can actually had, have the, the high-D molecule delivered via the water and actually give the producer more flexibility in its use. Thank you very much. And our final presenter today is Dr. John Bergstrom, Senior Technical Support Manager for DSM. John will be discussing the effects of inadequate vitamin supplementation. He will discuss the differences between adequate vitamin supplementation, suboptimal, and then optimum vitamin nutrition, or OVN, as we like to refer to it, and the need for special OVN applications. We'll touch on some critical stages where vitamin supplementation is really important, such as reproduction, weaning or stress, its role in immunity, and then maybe summer heat, and you will also touch on pork quality. Thank you, Casey. In an age when we're needing solutions to improve productivity and the sustainability of, of feeding a growing uh, population, uh, better nutrition is going to be an important part of improving health and productivity outcomes without the use of growth-promoting antibiotics. Uh, the term vitamin was first used in 1912, so in 2012 we were actually celebrating 100 years of vitamins. Uh, vitamin deficiency diseases had uh, plagued humanity and animals uh, since antiquity. But in the early 20th century, with the, the identification of vitamins, there was a lot of research around vitamins in the early part of the 20th century, uh, which helped advance our knowledge immensely about their importance in nutrition. Uh, vitamins are, are a category of nutrients. They're recognized as being essential for sustaining life, and they're absolutely required in the diet to uh, meet the requirements of the animal in order to maintain health and promote the, the growth, development, and reproduction. 
Uh, they're recognized commonly because they're uh, organic compounds that fulfill catalytic functions within the animal or people that are absolutely essential for normal metabolism. Uh, relative to other nutrients, though, they're required in very minute or small amounts, and so that makes doing research with these uh, nutrients uh, quite difficult compared to other nutrients that we're more familiar with, like protein and amino acids uh, or carbohydrates and things of that nature. Um, and because of the difficulty in doing uh, research in the area of vitamins with respect to meeting requirements, uh, there, there's much less research that has been done with vitamins relative, relative to some other nutrients. Um, and also the limited body of research that exists relating to vitamins uh, spans a number of decades and uh, it generally utilized less productive uh, genotypes than what we have today, less intensive housing conditions, and inherently these studies were, designed, were undertaken in controlled conditions using relatively small populations of animals and the requirements are generally uh, established as those required to merely prevent a deficiency disease and not necessarily to characterize the requirements needed for optimum performance. Uh, research conditions representing modern genotypes are, are quite rare in the field of vitamins, uh, including conditions where animals may be exposed to disease, challenges, pathogenic diseases, uh, adverse environments, or, or other dietary variables such as contamination with mycotoxins, um, or, or vitamin antagonists in the diet, or other stressors such as heat stress. Um, studies have rarely been purposely designed to apply research to establish what the optimal requirements may be uh, for vitamins under those maybe less desirable conditions. Uh, nevertheless, we do have uh, some evidence based on diagnostic cases that occur out in the real world. Uh, and, and as well as some rare research uh, that has been actually designed to evaluate requirements under adverse conditions. And one study that I recall was actually in feedstuffs in 1997, worked by uh, Quelo and Cousins, which looked at uh, three different levels of stressors applied to growing and finishing pigs. And then they looked at different uh, levels of vitamin supplementation with the NRC, which is quite recognized as meeting the requirements for preventing uh, deficiency diseases. And then based on an industry survey they had done, they fed increasing levels uh, of vitamin supplementation. And what they observed is that under conditions of low stress, ideal conditions, uh, the requirements uh, could be quite low and still result in, in acceptable productivity. But when the stressors were increased, such as increased animal density, mycotoxins in the feed, exposure to a pathogen, uh, then the requi animals required greater amounts of supplementation in order to perform better. And so, and, and, and it was not just growth rate and feed conversion that were improved, but also remarkable uh, reductions in the mortality that was found. In, that po in the populations of pigs used in that study. And so with increasing knowledge and research uh, capabilities going into the future, and DSM is heavily invested in working with uh, uh, universities and other uh, people that are invested in, in learning more about how vitamins are important, uh, we, we know that there's evidence and it's increasing that increased levels of specific vitamins can improve the outcomes for lifetime number of pigs produced per breeding animal, which Dr. Stalder already pointed out is a metric we should be looking at more commonly uh, to be successful in our industry, and uh, also for reproductive and skeletal function, like Dr. Hahn mentioned, with high D and vitamin D being essential for that. Um, and then there are studies showing the importance of B vitamins in, in fetal development, particularly for neurological development, and, and then studies with uh, vitamins such as vitamin E and its importance relative to immune function. So when an animal becomes challenged with a pathogen, 
it has a much more uh, robust immune system and capability of dealing with that pathogen. A lot of nutritionists do supplement and provide a margin of safety uh, to prevent deficiency risks, but we still find uh, reports from the field at various times where there may be inadequate vitamin supplementation to deal with some of the, the particular stresses in a particular case. And so we promote, uh, we have the OVN recommendations, which means optimal vitamin nutrition, and those are levels that we have found that most currently, based on the information that exists, will uh, optimize the performance and reduce the risk uh, of, of losses in production or losses in welfare of animals due to inadequate nutrition under challenges. And so what I'd like to end with is just remind you that vitamins are essential. The levels and needs uh, that are required for success uh, differ across life stages. Thus, we have recommendations that are specific to each life stage. And that thirdly, the levels necessar necessary to merely prevent gross deficiencies are not enough to optimize productivity and, and the efficiency of food production. So with that, I thank you all for your attendance this morning, and uh, I'll turn it over to Dr. Uh, Bradley again. Thank you. Well, thank you, John, for that lovely discussion on vitamins. Um, but before we go, there's one thing um, we want to discuss is DSM's commitment to innovation. We know from recent publications in um, industry discussion, mortality is a challenge. We also know that this mortality is a growing concern for the industry by the call of the Pork Board and the FFRA grant proposals this year, looking at not only sow mortality as was last year's proposal, but looking at mortality throughout the production cycle. Sow mortality has been on a steady incline since 20, uh, 2012, with about current estimates around 12%, and that maybe 12 to 35% of the pigs born never really make it to market. And we have a clear uh, lack of understanding of, of why some of this mortality is occurring. Furthermore, John touched on a little bit of the lack of um, basic nutrition requirements or research done on the requirements of animals. For example, the most recent NRC back in 2012 was there's only four trials to determine the SID lysine values for gestating sows. So you can pick any nutrient you want. You can look in NRC. You can find limited research, especially in the sow nutrition and developing gilts. And you can also see most of the research is done is possibly 40 years ago even from. But so there is a lack of ability to look at research um, in sows. And so, but instead of just talking about the problem, we kind of wanted to discuss DSM is making a commitment to lead the way in sow research in North America or the U.S. and Canada. This commitment started with my um, joining the team here about two months ago uh, as part of the North America or U.S. and Canada Innovation and Application Centers. So DSM's making a commitment to bring innovative regional solutions to the industry by putting in these uh, innovation and application um, centers within different regions of the globe. And so we're in currently developing some strategic partnerships with three to four producers looking at um, creating a sow research facility here in the Midwest. We don't have exact details what that's going to look like, but we're hoping around 2,500 to 5,000 sow type of unit to have some modern genetics and large-scale production to look at sow nutrition research. Long term, we look at also including in gilt development, the gestation and lactation portions of research, and then also nursery and finishing to really understand the true production cycle of fetus to fork nutrition, as I, I like to coin it and looking at that nutritional impacts we could have. This is kind of consistent with DSM started this a year and a half ago in the poultry with our platinum poultry mini pen systems where we conduct nutrition research in commercial conditions to understand how nutrition plays a role. And then long term we want to create something like that as well in the swine industry to where we create a platinum sow consortium 
We're still evaluating what that looks like, but we, we'd hope we'd have multiple cell units across the U.S. and Canada so we could have different genetics, different management, different housing, and different feedstuff opportunities to really evaluate nutritional impacts of sows.